Welcome everyone to the third and final event in Mass Challenges 2022 Health Equity Series, Health Equity Internationally. For those who may be unaware, our Health Equity Series is a part of Mass Challenges Health Tech Program. And the Health Tech Program was launched in 2016 and designed to be a digital health innovation hub. Every single year we source innovative startups and connect them with industry leading partners and collaborators as they work in pursuit of shared goals. The health equity has emerged as an overarching challenge area for the past three years across our health tech community. And although recent events have brought much needed attention to both surface level and structural inequities, we understand that these are longstanding issues and created this series in hopes of fostering long-term dialogue on these topics. This year, we have a three-part series and our first event centered on health equity and data, exploring questions around the collection, analysis, standardization, and distribution of health data. The second was on health equity and government, discussing the ways policy can and should shape access to healthcare. But today, we are excited to both widen the aperture and narrow the focus. Our panel today features three startups from our current 2022 health tech cohort, two of which have actually participated in our HHS sponsored Pandemic X program. We'll discuss how they think about health equity and the ways they're trying to improve healthcare around the world. But here to lead this conversation and share her perspective is Dr. Wiljiana Glover, the moderator for this panel. Wiljiana is the Kletchen Foundation Distinguished Professor of Operations and Innovation, excuse me, Distinguished Professor of Health Innovation and Entrepreneurship and Associate Professor of Operations and Information Management and the Founding Faculty Director of the Carrie Healy Center for Health Innovation and Entrepreneurship. Professor Glover studies the use of healthcare improvement and innovation practices to achieve more effective, efficient, and equitable care via hospitals and health startups. Wiljiana is also co-founder and COO of Match Medical Practice Solutions, a healthcare revenue cycle management firm. But in addition, we have three incredible startup leaders for the panel as well. Krista McFarlane is the founder and CEO of Patientory. Patientory is empowering people to take charge of their own health. They're revolutionizing the way doctors and patients interact and gain access to information, cutting out all layers and processes that currently are stumbling blocks in care. They connect doctors, care providers, and consumers all within a single secure platform, creating a care team that works together to provide the best care possible. Next, Jim Gabriel is the chairman of CardMedic, a unique multi-award winning website and app that improves communication between healthcare staff and patients across any barrier inducing any, any barrier, including foreign language, visual, hearing, or cognitive impairment, or PPE. Written simply and succinctly by clinical experts, CardMedic encompasses an A to Z collection of digital flashcards replicating clinical conversations around common healthcare topics. Finally, Tahar John Mohamed is the founder and CEO of Managing Life, which offers a comprehensive digital solution for managing pain, improving self-management, measurement, and remote monitoring. Over 30,000 people from over 130 countries have used their app-based solution to manage their chronic pain and medications, such as opioids. And it's deployed at at least five hospitals, including a VA hospital in San Francisco and two large insurers. So thank you all so very much for joining. And I'm going to pass it over to Wiljiana to get us started. Thank you so much, Lucas. So Wiljiana Glover here. So excited to chat with you three about um, your view of health equity, right? And how it has shaped um, considerations as you've, uh, as you've grown your, your respective startups. Um, so I'll start with just a general question and maybe we'll go in reverse order to, to get going. Um, so to here, I'm very curious pleasure um, to have you on this panel and really interested in everyone answering this first question. Um, so the question will be, what is health equity to you? What does that mean um, for you personally, for you professionally, and how, in what ways is it important for entrepreneurs to build solutions with an health, a health equity lens or with health equity in mind? So I'll start with Tahir, go with Krista, and then finally Jim. Sure. Thanks. Um, so I should preface this by saying I'm located in Toronto, Canada. So our health care system <laughs> is uh, quite different from the U.S. But I can address the question um, by talking specifically about the world of chronic pain, because I think it's a good uh, representation of the general issues that we have across healthcare. So um, in the world of chronic pain, 
research has shown time and time again that marginalized communities and those in vulnerable communities are less treated for their pain. Uh, they receive less care. They receive fewer medications to manage their pain. For all intents and purposes, they're less believed. Um, and a, for example, I believe digital health can help overcome some of these challenges by improving access to specialists. That's the obvious uh, solution for digital health. But I think another opportunity is to provide a voice to those that may not have a voice within the healthcare system that are looking to overcome systemic bias. So an example that is directly relevant to us, for example, is in our multi-site validation study that we did at three different hospitals, we had two urban academic hospitals, Toronto General, Toronto Western. Toronto is a very large city, 6 million people. But then we included a third site called Iroquois Falls. Iroquois Falls is a tiny town of 4,500. It's 11 hours north of Toronto. They're the only clinic in a three-hour catchment area, and they service a large number of First Nation reserves. And many people in that community had struggled with opioid use. And the reason for that is because many just didn't trust the healthcare system. And when they did finally engage the healthcare system, it was when they're so far down their path of dealing with chronic pain that they drove four hours to the nearest hospital and ended up in the ER and were dismissed as drug seekers from the reserve. And so that's just a very small microcosm, I think, of the healthcare system. And so with a solution like ours, they were able to track their pain, uh, describe their pain to a family practitioner well in advance of it becoming a emergency situation where they would show up in an ER looking for medications. And so I think there's many different opportunities for digital health. And I think improving access and providing a voice are two uh, really tangible examples. Thank you for that. A, a world where patients are seen, believed, heard, trusted, and treated. Um, that, that's really powerful. Thank you, Tahir. Uh, Carissa. Yeah, no, I will definitely, you know, echo what Tahir said. And I'm um, just looking at it from a technology lens, you know, we're a, a, a product company. Um, starting with, for me, what does health equity mean? I, you know, I see health equity achieved um, when every person has the opportunity to attain his or her full health potential, um, where no one is disadvantaged disadvantage from achieving this potential because of social position um, or other socially determined circumstances. Um, and we see these health inequities reflected in like length of life, quality of life, rates of disease, disability, um, overall death or, or just access to treatment. Um, and today, you know, unconscious bias and hidden inequities can perpetuate these disparities in engagement with health technologies, right? And this may be due to just cost, um, access, and location um, of these healthcare services, which ultimately creates that unlevel, you know, playing field for disadvantage. Um, how our, you know, company today is, is looking at health equity, we actually just launched the Digital Health for Equitable Health Alliance, um, which is a you know, first in its kind to really form and bring together um, historically, you know, black colleges and, and university um, medical schools, along with um, technology, digital health technology partners, um, you know, nonprofit organizations to help to, you know, lobby um, for the advancement of, of health equity um, in, in healthcare, whether that's looking at, you know, looking at certain reimbursements, um, you know, on the CMS side, um, or looking and lobbying for, you know, in clinical trials, you know, having these trial sites provide technologies in, in underserved areas. Um, so I think just by having all these stakeholders together, you know, we can start to see where we can um, essentially decrease for, for these inequities. It's powerful to see how a startup is already making a, a, a inroads into policy as well. That's, that's really exciting. Um, so we've talked about Canada, the US, and now the UK um, and, and more. Um, so Jim, your definition. Hello there, hello. Yes, yes, I'm in the UK where we have a, another kind of healthcare system uh, representing Card Medic. And what does health, equity mean to me? Well, uh, I, I would agree wholeheartedly with the, I don't want to sort of run the risk of boring you by saying pretty much exactly the same things that uh, uh, that Chris uh, and, and Tahir have said. Um, the thing that really strikes me though is that we're, we're attempting, at least in, in westernized healthcare, um, to address health inequalities. And I understand health 
equity as giving everybody a level playing field. On the one hand, you're addressing the inequalities, but the, the equity part of the equation is, is making it a fair starting point for everybody. And um, this is a, a, a subject that we, that we uh, run into or deal with every single day of our working lives at Card Medic. Card Medic happened almost by accident at the beginning of the coronavirus lockdown in 2020. Dr. Rachel Grimaldi, the founder of uh, uh, or co-founder of Card Medic, uh, was on maternity leave visiting family in the United States and all flights were cancelled. Everybody got locked down. She got stuck in Florida for seven months and was reading scary news item after scary news item about what coronavirus was doing to the world. And I uh, read an interview with uh, a young, privileged, well-educated, English-speaking British guy who came out of hospital, nearly died of coronavirus, and um, survived and told his, his tale uh, that he was absolutely terrified for every second he'd been in the hospital because he couldn't understand the thing that anybody was saying to him. And that started Card Medic, basically. The, uh, 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 Rachel got in touch with friends, discovered that this was a story that everybody was experiencing. And at the time, it was the noise of the machines in the ICU and it was the, the, uh, the uh, PPE uh, that was making it impossible to hear things. Um, and, and so she wrote down every single conversation she could imagine wanting to have with the patient in an emergency setting, put it on digital flashcards. Her husband, who's in e-commerce, put it on a website. They put it out there with their friends and said, spread the word. And um, within no time, there were 8,000 downloads and, and uh, 120 countries involved in, in using this. And so Cardmedic was born because very quickly it became apparent that this is a universal problem. And at the beginning, this was just an English language set of scripts, but very quickly people, people were saying, can you translate it? Can you do sign language? Can you do easy read? Can you do read aloud? Can you do live translation? And um, the, 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 the idea has pretty much gone viral and we're running into situations again and again and again, every single day we hear fantastic use case stories. Some of them are quite tragic actually. And um, uh, the, the, the uh, experience of this is exposing huge inequalities and um, it doesn't really matter whether we legislate for it. Uh, if you can't give people tools that actually level out that playing field and give people a fair starting point, um, we're not going to get anywhere. So that, that, that's Carb Medic in a nutshell. And it's a space that I, um, I love working in, the, the idea of, of giving people healthcare in their own language so that they're not terrified in hospitals and pharmacies and in doctor's surgeries and so on. So it didn't bore us at all because I think what is, is really unique and I think really powerful about conversations around health equity with startups is that each startup will think about it slightly differently, right? Determining or depending on their particular context. Um, so what I heard from you, Jim, was much more about patient-centric, you know, a patient-centric approach and, and what that means for leveling the playing field. Um, and I think all of these um, viewpoints are extremely valuable. So thank you for sharing. Um, Chris, I want to start with you on this one, um, and we're going to have a, a bit of a conversation, I, I think, to that point about sort of how you uh, operationalize it, um, what does it look like, um, and, and how um, you present it as not like, a, a, this would be nice to think about health equity over here sort of thing, but really a value proposition, right, a value proposition that, that investors see, see the value of, um, so specifically for Chris. I'll ask um, for you to, to think about that, but specifically how you're using blockchain technology um, as your approach to democratize healthcare access. Definitely, definitely. Well, you know, part of our blockchain, um, you know, just value statement is the ability, like you mentioned, to de democratize healthcare. So in fact, we're, you know, targeted health inequity um, and, and really leveling the playing field um, 
through the use of technology, you know, by using um, blockchain. Our core vision is to build a healthier future for all by becoming that home of, of patient data. Um, and we believe like impacting population starts with impacting one person at a time. So if we're able to equip and empower individuals with actionable, you know, data-driven insights, particularly, specifically from, from their health care information, and, and their data that they're generated on a daily basis, we're then able to improve, you know, overall health and well-being. Um, and blockchain really sets that infrastructure. Um, you know, it's not the end-all be-all to our, our technology stack, but it's really able to, to set that, that infrastructure um, as a technology advancement that facilitates um, not only the storing, um, but the easily, the easily accept you know, to be easily access um, the information um, from disparate data sets, um, you know, where we can now start to employ things like identity verification, um, consent management of information, um, which everyone, you know, can participate in. That's great. And I think that um, that participation reminds me of some of the things to hear that you were talking about earlier in terms of um, patients being uh, heard and trusted um, and seen in terms of their opioid care. So I'll go to you next, uh, or, or for their pain management care, rather. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that approach to pain management and how you want people to think differently about the opioid crisis, um, particularly for underrepresented patient populations? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, we obviously in both of our countries have a challenge with opioid use. Uh, opioid use fatalities have continued to escalate. It's it's a real crisis for sure. Um, but I think in many cases, opioids aren't necessarily bad because they work. Uh, they work for managing acute pain. Um, they've been challenging to when they're used for chronic pain conditions. Um, so it just really needs to be used in the right time and place. But more importantly, rather than trying to address the opioid epidemic by um, stopping doctors from prescribing it or putting in all these obstacles and checkpoints and making clinicians scared to actually treat pain with opioid medication, the answer should be to provide better pain treatment earlier on in the cycle so it doesn't get to that point in the first place. And the reason I say that is because the gold standard for managing pain is a multidisciplinary approach. It means combining education with self-management, with psychology, with physiotherapy, with someone that's just listening and caring for your situation early on in that cycle. So it doesn't devolve into requiring a surgery or long-term opioid. And unfortunately, the reality is that there aren't enough multidisciplinary pain clinics in either Canada or the US, and there never will be you're never going to be able to establish a multidisciplinary chronic pain clinic in a rural community that's several hours removed from the nearest urban center. And so um, part of what we've been trying to do is connect those patients with the specialties or specialists in the urban centers where they exist and to lower the obstacles or the barriers so that those specialists can actually treat those patients digitally and remotely. And that, that's one way that our solution is really addressing some of that, that is by allowing people to track their pain, their medication usage, their functionality on a day-to-day -day basis while self-managing, and at the same time, being able to share that information remotely with specialists that don't necessarily have to be in the same physical city as them. Thank you for sharing that. So again, helping us to think about equity in terms of, we've talked about ethnicity, but also geographic location, right? Where someone is and to make sure that they have access. Um, Jim, I'll go to you next. Um, we've, we've talked a little bit about your company overall. So I wanna ask more about um, the focus for CardMedic on universalizing healthcare communication um, and, and why you think healthcare systems should be thinking about this for underrepresented patient populations. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, um, well, I, I'm, I'm surprised every day by the use cases that we hear um, when talking about card medics people. There's, we've never once had anybody in a clinical setting um, push back and say, we don't need this. Um, I think sometimes people get, uh, they jump to conclusions and think what we're trying to do is to get rid of translators and, and um, uh, speech and language therapists and the kind of people you'd expect in a clinical setting to, uh, to help a patient understand what the doctor's saying or the nurse is saying. 
Um, but the reality of, uh, of that is that that's an incredibly expensive and um, uh, a quite unreliable service in almost all healthcare settings. And it's really only practicable to, to be applying those sorts of support services when you're talking about an elective operation in a well-financed healthcare setting where everybody knows who's coming, when they're coming, and what it is we're going to be talking about. And, and unfortunately, that's a very, very small fraction of the time, times that, um, um, that you actually need to, 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 to access services like that. So Card Medics is all about the gaps in service provision, because if you want to achieve excellence in communication in healthcare, you need to be doing that 24 seven, 365 with everybody, regardless of their, you know, their, their ethnicity, their beliefs, their, their, their language, their learning um, differences potentially. Um, and the, um, the, the, the people who, who kind of get it really quickly are those who constantly have crisis situations happening. And, and, and interestingly, I mean, we're a very young business. We've only actually had a commercializable MVP for less than a year. And we, um, we're in, in the UK, we're going viral as it were in maternity settings where uh, you've got that combination of the need to communicate very clearly and to act very swiftly in, in what effectively is a, a potentially emergency situation. And, and, and not being able to communicate with uh, a lady giving birth is one of the most dangerous situations that, um, that you can imagine in a hospital setting. And uh, it, 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 in hindsight, not surprising that this is, um, uh, this is the setting where Card Medic is, is seeing such huge uptake, but we're seeing this uh, around the, the world. You know, we, it, it's a very, 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 very long time since we're able to, able to say things like, you know, you can speak any language you like as long as it's English, or if you're in Spain, you know, any language you like as long as it's Spanish. Um, most um, uh, most um, healthcare settings would, would you know, as you apply the kind of the 80 20 rule, uh, in uh, uh, every country there's a different set of language every region within a country there's a different set of languages that that people are looking for in, in order to be able to cover um, a, a total population or a demographic and you're looking at a sort of a minimum of somewhere between 15 and 20 to get anywhere close to the 80 20, uh, 80, 20 which always leaves people uh, unhelped and and one of the very shocking things is we don't count this stuff we don't and if you don't if you don't count it you don't know about it so we're talking to pharmacists where they say you know uh, uh, something like 97 98 percent of the people who present at the pharmacy actually physically in person in our stores all speak fluent english and we say well you're not counting the people who don't go to the pharmacy because they're terrified they don't know how to communicate so they send their their friends their neighbors their carers and um and uh, and just miss out on on the most basic healthcare support. Sorry, I'm probably talking too long now, but it's a it's a, it's a it's a passion, and we see um, Card Medic as 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 necessary all around the globe. And quite deliberately, we priced it low enough so that it's, there's there's no no huge barrier to entry. Um, what we're trying to do is to make a sustainable business, cover our costs, pay for the the, the most culturally and clinically appropriate translation services around the world to help us grow um, and uh, as much as possible give back so there's a free version that's available to be downloaded anywhere uh, on the planet in, in an emergency which will effectively get you out of jail free as it were um, in, a, in a crisis situation and quite deliberately so because Rachel believes passionately in, uh, in um, uh, 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 leveling the playing field. Thank you for that, Jim. And it, it leads me to think about, because you're, you're starting now to talk about like the business model, right? And the choices that we need to make, um, I think for, for other startups that might be listening um, in terms of um, 
and do we think about it as, as trade-offs between, um, you know, I want to make sure that I reach, um, you know, X patient population. So how do I need to think about like the cost structure, et cetera. So you talked about, you know, having a free version. Um, so I, I wanna ask each of you, I'll, I'll make it a more pointed question for you. Um, how do you think about um, your business model for health equity? Like what has that meant for you um, in your business? Jim, you started talking about it. So maybe I'll start with you and stay there for, for a little while. You said, you know, you all have a free version. Um, who is your customer for your paid version? And if you have any general advice um, for startups that are trying to think about, you know, reaching underserved patient populations, how do they think about the cost structure of, of their startup? Yeah, thank you very much indeed for asking me that. Well, I did actually, yes, I absolutely started down, down this um, down this road. Um, a card medic was originally designed just to be completely free. And that's not sustainable because it's a very expensive thing to build. And it's a giant content model behind it. And you never run out of clinical conversations to add to the system. So it does need to pay for itself. And, um, and, and we identified within... Uh, all the regions of the world that we want to sell into uh, hospital systems as sort of the secondary acute part of healthcare provision as the the best customers to start off with and we recognize that that this is a universal um, problem and it and the solution should also be uh, universally uh, available so accessibility is, is is a huge part of how we we're, we're going to market so we are making it easy for entire health systems to use it and in, in the uk for example we've recently once again restructured the healthcare provision which, which happens um almost at the drop of a hat um uh, every few years and um we now have what we call integrated care systems uh, which are um regional in nature and they include everything so they include the primary care the secondary care the mental health the community care the social care all under one umbrella of administration. And uh, at least half our customers in the first year have been integrated care systems who recognize that everybody needs to have this. And at the moment, it's been written very much from a, um, from a, uh, a secondary acute care perspective. So we don't have all the conversations that we'd want to have yet for mental health provision and so on. But, um, um, but that's just a matter of time and it's, it's, it's rolling out uh, very rapidly and getting bigger and bigger and bigger um and the the model is all about making it sustainable um part of the uh part of the longer term goal is to actually create a foundation a charitable foundation which will which will um help in theaters of war help in refugee situations um and because of the background of the uh, of the business and founders is going to help uh, uh, underprivileged uh female entrepreneurs around the world um, where they don't have help to uh, through, through, through the um, traditional channels. Um, that's very much the future, though, because we're still uh, we're still learning to walk. Haven't yet um, got to the point where we're running. But my my advice would be to, if you if you care deeply about health equity, is to make something accessible from the get go. Thank you for that. So, Sarah, I'll go to you next. How have you all you know chosen to structure um, or, or rather align incentives, as it were, um, for for managing life? Yeah, it's a it's a challenging issue, not only for us, for most digital health companies. Um, chronic pain in general is correlated with lower socioeconomic status. And so direct to consumer wasn't really ever going to be our business model. So uh, like Jim, we have a free version of our app. We try to give up as much functionality as possible to give people the tools they need to manage the pain. But ultimately, our business model um, ended up following the money. So uh, we looked at where the cost of chronic pain was accruing to, and we identified two main groups or segments that we are focused on. There's organizations that care about reducing medical spend. Um, chronic pain is prevalent. It's one in five. It's the reason people go to the doctor, to the ER, take medications, get surgeries. And so if you can better address chronic pain, you can lower utilization of the healthcare system at some point in the future. And so the organizations that care about that are self-funded employers, uh, cap, uh, health plans and capitated systems like Medicare Advantage, Medicaid, or at-risk providers like IDNs. And so that is our business model is essentially to license our solution to those organizations who sponsor the use of our solution for their patients. And in return, they get access to 
uh, obviously improve patient outcomes, but we also have a monitoring portal that allows them to view this information and use the data for research and clinical purposes. The second segment was something that was a little bit of a surprise for us. Um, about 30 to 50% of the typical disability portfolio is due to people with chronic pain. And so we actually license our solution to disability carriers whose goal is to essentially help people get the care they need so they get off claim and back to work faster. And so that is really where we've been focusing. It may or may not be the right model, but uh, we've had a lot of traction so far in pers pursuing that model and making sure that we can still always keep a free version. Yeah, that's a, a really smart way to think about your market segmentation. So thank you for, for sharing that. Um, Krissa, over to you in terms of um, how you align incentives. Absolutely. Well, similar to Jim and to here, you know, we, we had to realize early on that, you know, our users were separate from our customers, right? Um, we're providing an app, you know, a decentralized application for people to own and access their data, but also learn, you know, what their healthcare information means to them. And part of that, and especially grown as a company is showing, you know, fast growth, right? And adoption and, you know, people don't like paying for things. So, you know, in our model, we're a B2B to B to C. Um, so eventually, you know, we're able to create a, a business model that would essentially benefit our stakeholders and customers um, through a, a subscription, right? Because in realizing data, real-time data, um, which doesn't exist today, as we saw, you know, which happened in COVID-19 pandemic, you know, with the lack of readily available information, um, we were able to bring that value proposition to the forefront. But also looking at blockchain and, you know, Web3, which is, you know, the, the new innovation, you know, set, set in the new stage for, for the internet and moving forward, um, we, we have the ability to create a shared ecosystem um, through the use of a, a blockchain network um, where stakeholders can come together and be incentivized either to, to host the network. Um, so, so we start to, to bring these stakeholders who traditionally um, you know, weren't connected, you know, the payers, the insurance companies, the providers, and pharma, you know, healthcare pretty much in the U.S. today um, is siloed, and we believe it's because of, of, of that siloed infrastructure um, through the electronic medical records that has been built. Um, so by building that infrastructure and bringing these new stake, these stakeholders together, we can definitely see new business models emerge from that shared interest in healthcare um, information, both clinical data um, and financial data down the line. Thank you all both, or uh, thank you everyone for, for sharing um, your thoughts on that. Now we're open for Q&A from the audience. I feel like I could talk to you all for quite some time. Um, so I, I hope that you look forward to my emails in your, in your inbox. This is a, a fascinating conversation. Um, we're starting to get some Q&A in, so feel free to ask those questions, um, the things that you're wondering either for your startup or how your organization might interface with these organizations that we have here today, um, put those questions in the chat. Um, our first one is in, um, and so it was for me, um, but I might also pose it to you all as well. Um, what gives us hope as we look around the world and see successful innovation and collaboration? Um, I, I think that's a fantastic question, and there are many things to be hopeful for. I think, you know, even Mass Challenge for having this conversation, because this is a conversation that we wouldn't have necessarily had to plus years ago, right? Um, and so for us to even be bringing um, conversations of health equity to the forefront um, is, is really powerful. I think some specific um, you know, opportunities that we see in terms of successful um, innovation and collaboration, it per perhaps because I'm in an academic setting, is that I'm seeing much more collaboration between academics, right, and startups um, and, and different groups. And, and the way that we can learn from one another has been phenomenal. We're also collaborating more with other institutions so it just it, it's creating more of this ecosystem around health equity um, to have these conversations that we hadn't necessarily had before. Um, but I'll, I'll ask, um, Chris, I'll ask you first, what are you noticing in terms of um, that's giving you hope around successful innovation and collaboration? Absolutely. And I would definitely liken it to Mass Challenge, you know, being on a, a panel with, you know, fellow um, startup um, you know, from Canada to UK. Similarly, um, I'm part of another, you know, accelerated incubator um, where CEOs come together, you know, every um, two months, 
you know, just to talk about challenges that, you know, they're seeing in their startup. So I think part of that is, it's just being part of, of that, that ecosystem and that community um, where we come together and we're able to, you know, voice and, and share um, not only ideas, but essentially challenges and, and how we're able to provide solutions moving forward. So Sarah, what sort of you hope these days towards uh, successful innovation and collaboration? Sorry, yeah, I think uh, I think your point about academia uh, acknowledging that innovation is not going to come from academic settings when it comes to digital. Um, there's fantastic things that come out of academic centers, don't get me wrong, and I think they play a role in the whole digital uh, ecosystem, um, particularly in terms of validation. Uh, but it's, it is it is relatively slow moving. And in, as tech companies, we are able to iterate and learn and push stuff out to the market and get feedback within a week before you even put together a research protocol, for example. And so I think... Um, it is a really strong partnership and that gives me hope because it's not just tech running wild and creating things that may or may not work. Um, there is still the checks and balances through traditional uh, academia and validation studies, uh, but at the same time, it's another channel to get uh, innovation out there faster. So that gives me hope is that there are models that are evolving and recognizing that. Absolutely, absolutely, I, I completely agree. Um, Jim. Yeah, that, it, it, a different answer to this question for me. Uh, I um, I have a hat as an innovation advisor for Oxford University Hospitals, where I work on an accelerator program, which is where I, I met Rachel Grimaldi from Cardmedic. And my role there is from the commercial perspective. I've spent my life in high tech, high growth, a lot of digital health tech um, in, in later years of my career. And I know how to sell to hospitals. I understand how to sell to hospitals. I love selling to hospitals. I, um, I, I get how that works. So I advise people on how to get a business that, um, that into a, a position where they can actually sell into healthcare, how to do that. And, uh, and that probably never gets any easier. But what does get easier is um, our experience of the world post COVID. I mean, we've got, uh, we, we, we um, wrote a response to COVID report uh, in Oxford, um, where we discovered that the, that the, dig the, digital, the strategic digital five-year plan for Oxford University Hospitals had been implemented in the first two weeks of lockdown, the whole thing, total uptake of everything. And um, we found that that story matches all over the, the, the all around the world. And the so, so the readiness to go to to embrace new technology is much 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 greater now. So people are far more likely to um, to do a lot of things. One one is to entertain the possibility that you've got something that's really exciting. Two is to be sold to online. You know, all the sales that we've achieved with Carbonetic, we've managed to do without getting out of our our own homes by and large. You know, it's been online. It's been digital. It's been without. Um, destroying the planet by driving everywhere and flying everywhere and uh, um, and having forced meetings in, in, in rooms together. So that, that gives me hope where everything is much, much, much faster moving and the world post COVID understands um, how important a role technology will play far, far better uh, than only two years ago. I agree. I agree with you also, Jim. I do think we're much faster than, than we have been traditionally in academic centers. And, and we're sort of all meeting in the middle, right? Yeah. Um, and, able, and able to work together um, in, in a different way. So that's exciting. Um, yeah. I'll also say maybe a, a quick plug. So I'm the faculty director for the Carrie Murphy Healy Center for Health Innovation and Entrepreneurship at Babson. And one of the things that, that we've been noticing also is, you know, more work in, in low and middle income countries and, and more startups kind of coming out of that space. I'm curious if you all are noticing um, either like kind of a, a kind of comrades as it were, so companies that might be in a similar space that are doing work in different um, parts of the world, um, or if you all are doing work in different parts of the world um, and what you're noticing as we're talking internationally, what you're noticing in low and middle income countries. For whoever would like to answer, yeah, to hear. 
Yeah, so uh, we, we started off as a global solution through the App Store. Uh, we have users from over 130 different countries. We support seven different languages, um, including some that you may not expect. So we have English, French, German, Spanish, but also simplified Chinese, Russian, and Korean. And so the idea here is to try to offer these types of solutions regardless of where people are in the world, because that's kind of the benefit of digital health. Um, there are people that use our app that I'm realizing there's probably a greater need um, that I wouldn't have expected based on just simple usage of, of our app. So that's how we're trying to, or we see a global opportunity to what we do. And the fact that, you know, you push something out to the app store and you can reach literally billions of people immediately represents a significant opportunity. Thank you for that. Krista and then Jim. Yeah, so we also started out as a global um, company just with our blockchain. So, you know, about a couple of years ago, we were one of the, the first, I would say, healthcare cryptocurrencies that emerged. Um, we created our white paper. It was in over 14 different languages. And, and what we saw was this community of over 3,000 people come together from all over the world because they realized the potential and the impact um, that healthcare technology can have, especially in looking at, you know, underserved um, areas, rural areas. Um, so with that, you know, our token, which is traded globally, is accessible. Um, but what we've seen is, you know, we've created an, essentially an ambassadorship of subject matter experts in these regions. And what we've seen is really an, an ignition of policies and, 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 and essentially uh, with the with COVID, um, the acceleration of you know how are we going to get to this new Web three, um, to this new digital economy? Um, so now we've seen you know the EU, which just launched you know last week the European Data Health Initiative, right, which has been talks in talks for you know years and years. Um, so with that, I think you know community does really play an important part um, to really drive that innovation forward. Thank you for that. Yeah, and I think I would echo all of the above. And I, I would, would add to that, one of the really surprising um, things that happened to us at Carb Medic is, is uh, somebody got in touch with us when there was a lot of information out there about Carb Medic because, because the um, reaction to it had been so exciting. Um, somebody got in touch with us from, from a refugee camp in Kenya saying uh, that they had a charity that was... Uh, um, trying to give uh, paid employment to refugees and they had a really large number of very highly trained clinicians, doctors, nurses, pediatricians, whatever, um, in refugee camps who had nothing to do, absolutely nothing to do. And could these people translate our content and, um, and also at the same time learn IT skills from the charity giving them laptops and uh, teaching them how to use uh, uh, office products and so on. Um, and uh, it was such, it was such a, a, an exciting idea. We, we actually now uh, have a very large part of our translation done by, uh, by, by this charity. And it's absolutely essential for us that when we're translating anything, it has a clinical nuance and it's culturally appropriate. And so you can't just do an automated translation. It has to be uh, picked up by a doctor or a nurse, uh, uh, you know, somebody who understands the, the the content and knows exactly how to write it down in their own languages. So that was um, that was a, a a really exciting event for us. That's that's fantastic. I think you all have have definitely so back to the kind of partnerships, right, and how that can also benefit the the kind of the long term vision of health equity and just equity, um, more generally speaking, right, in terms of um, economic equity. So that's that's really powerful. Um, the next question, I definitely want to start with Krista on this one. And, and because I think you all have thought about um, since 2013, like you have a trajectory of how you're thinking about policy. So let me ask the question and then and then I'll and then we'll go go to that. So so much of health equity, and thank you for the person that asked this great question. So so much of health equity work seems to be directed at systems change. Agreed. How do startups think about advocating for federal, state, and local policy? that pairs with their work. Um, so Krista, you all have thought about um, the policy piece. Um, how, how do you think about advocating for policy? How do you do it? Um, and 
in what ways has that changed? Have, has your thought about kind of policy advo uh, advocating for policy, how has that changed over time? Yeah, yeah. Well, first starting out, um, we know that when you start getting into advocating for policy, it's not it's not cheap, right? It's expensive, especially for an early stage startup. But you know, based on my my subject matter expertise, I was able to form alliances and partnerships with you know organizations that were already doing this. So part of that was through HIMSS. Um, I think you guys may be familiar with that, which is that global organization, health IT organization. Um, I was able to be involved more as. Um, you know, sitting on, on the interoperability committee where we actually were able to draft responses to a lot of the policies that were coming out a couple of years ago. So that one of that was the data blocking rule, the 21st Century Cures Act, um, as we know, which was passed about two years now, which really set the precedent for, you know, interoperability initiatives, right? Um, and set in that stage for, for startups like Patient Tory, um, to really take advantage of data exchange. Um, fast forward to today, you know, now we're able to, you know, launch an alliance through the partnership with, as I mentioned earlier, um, um, in our in our talk with with other organizations that can continue the work, you know, as we see fit in in meeting the needs um, of the market. Um, so I think early on, and, and you know, especially as a as a startup, just being able to form those relationships, um, even with organizations that are doing it today, but but be able to to advocate. Um, because we, we know our business as well, like no one else is going to, 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 to know it. So being able to have that, that voice of opinion um, in these environments um, definitely makes a, a difference. Thank you for that. Um, so here I wanna, and I'll ask everyone, I think this is interesting because we all sit in different countries. And so because of that, I think policy and what it looks like to advocate for policy is different. So here, when I think about your work, um, I know like the, the World Health Organization just did a big release um, around, uh, you know, the, the opioid crisis, but, but even not just that, just how we're thinking about kind of the mental health as well and, and, and making it more patient centric, kind of driving it down to the patient. Um, so, so in what ways are you all advocating for policy in Canada and, and abroad? Yeah, um, to Chris's point, it's it's really difficult as a startup to advocate or lobby for change uh, from a reimbursement perspective. Um, most recently, chronic pain was finally recognized as a standalone condition in ICD-10, which is the International Classification of Diseases, um, which means that hopefully now there's going to be more recognition that it actually exists as a standalone concept, and then more research dollars will be allocated to it, and hopefully that'll translate into more reimbursements. Um, but that's five, ten years down the road, which means, to be honest, it's not even on my radar because it is so far removed from our immediate needs as a startup, which is we need we need revenue now. Um, and so wherever possible, I will participate in creating awareness. I'll uh, work alongside uh, innovation uh, panels. Uh, I'll participate in conferences wherever I can, but I'm gonna kind of leave the heavy lifting to, to the bigger players um, and, and kind of add my two pieces wherever I can and uh, be opportunistic about finding ways to make it sustainable and fundable in the current environment, understanding that that may change. But if we can make something successful now, that'll mean it'll be only easier if and when those changes come down the pipe. So uh, may not be the answer you were looking for, but um, it's the reality that I'm dealing with. No, I think that's practical. And I think, um, you know, Jim, you all being kind of an, an earlier stage startup, I'm, I'm curious to, to hear your thoughts. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we're, we're following policy. Um, we're not, we're exactly. not uh, able to influence policy uh, at, at this stage, uh, and it would be, um, we wouldn't have the bandwidth for it, it would be just too expensive for us to be doing that kind of thing. But actually what we've discovered is that, is that it, particularly in the, in the, uh, the Western world, um, which is where we're getting the, 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 the bulk of the actual communication with customers, um, we're seeing downloads all over, the, all over the, the world, but where we're actually getting into conversation with hospital systems, where discovering that they all have one thing in common and that is that communication is incredibly important a correct communication and there are all sorts of uh, um, uh, uh, guidelines and principles and policies in place already to make sure that that you um, respect the patient's 
need to be communicated with in their language or with help if they need help and so on but the reality is that that's often not available to them and so one of the one, one of the, the the interesting problems that we that we um that we run into is that uh it, it's it's a sort of a, a don't don't do as i do do as i say kind of set up in hospitals because senior management teams will, will expressly forbid people to use friends family members other members of staff to do translation because of the dangers of it and, and or google translate or whatever um and it, it, I mean, the, the numbers are shocking something like 30 percent of all the litigation against healthcare providers in the united states is based on communication error so you you know how important it is it is a very 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 big number of dollars that um that this problem costs and and yet the reality of it is you've got no you've got no alternative in front line when you're in an emergency setting you ask a family member to translate or you have a member of staff who happens to speak the same language or and you get by because you need to and every second counts and um so we don't need to go out inventing policy for that it's already out there but what we are seeing is people that are embracing the ability to actually start seeing, to deliver more also seeing that around the uh the, the world we're, we're we're um seeing new titles come into play for um strategies for for budgets for job titles to do with diversity and equality and in, in, in inclusivity which um plays hugely into the space that we're operating thank you for sharing that this has been phenomenal. Thank you all so much. I, I might just wrap up with one last question before Angel gives us the wrap up music. Um, one word, one phrase, one lead. Um, we always try to wrap things up with, at Babson College with, with gifts. Um, so one, one word, one phrase, or a lead um, that would help people that want to do more, learn more um, in this space, health startups specifically, um, and what might help to health startups to continue their journey in health equity. A word, phrase, or lead. Krissa, Tahir, then Jim. Yeah, I, th I think just, you know, looking over our conversation, I might be going over, um, I would just say get connected, right? Um, that's the, the, the first start in, in really understanding and, and being able to identify the needs, especially of startups um, and the overall ecosystem. Thank you for that. Um, two, two small ones. Uh, the first is talk to patients first. Uh, innovation matters none if people don't use it and don't find value in it. And the second is follow the money, because ultimately we all have to get paid for what we do. And so following the cash and the flows of the cost of a particular issue is how you're going to find the right reimbursement. Thank you. That's good advice. And, and I would say have integrity. If you're working in healthcare, integrity is the single most important thing. Thank you for that. Thank you all so much. What a wonderful conversation. Um, super, super fortunate to have all these great startups come together and really discuss their solutions and how they're implementing health equity within it or how they're pushing forward health equity. And I just want to take some time to thank our wonderful moderator, Dr. Lover. Thank you so much for sharing your insight and really moderating and leading this conversation. And to Krissa, Jim, and Tahir, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and your expertise. I also want to take some time to thank our audience here. I just, again, if you've joined us from the first health equity initial, um, event to this one, or if this is your first one, we are super, super grateful for you all engaging in this conversation. It's a, it's a conversation that needs to be had, and we're fortunate to create the space and, and have experts like Again, Dr. Glover, Krista, and Jim, and Tahir really lead the conversation. But if you have not seen all of our other events, we actually have a recap page within our landing um, health equity page, which includes not only the last three events, including this wonderful conversation is going to be uploaded soon after, but also our last three events from our three events from last year. So you get to see all six events. There have been all amazing conversations. We look forward to having these conversations again next year, uh, but super, super grateful for not only our panelists, as well as our moderator and everybody that was able to join. And we hope to see you next year and having great conversations and really pushing forward um, the Health Equity Initiative. But thank you all for joining. I hope you have a blessed day.